Uh, Viktor Orban, uh, Prime Minister of Hungary and Europe's longest serving Premier. We just talked, you have done 17 years. Thank you for talking to us. I know that you have just signed a deal with Qatar and we're going to come back to that. But can we begin with the other reason why your country is in the news, Ukraine? Um, the basic issue with Ukraine, it's a sovereign country that was invaded by Russia. Just as you might say, Hungary was invaded by the Soviet Union back in 1956. I just watched a video last night. Your great heroes were people like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and John Paul II, who supported Hungary during that. Yesterday, your foreign minister said you would block the aid that the European Union wants to give to Ukraine at this particular time. And I wonder how you, a country that has, you know, you have been invaded by Russia, you know what that is like, why you do that? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the possibility yeah. to have the conversation. Um, one small uh, additional remark. 17 years in power and 16 years in opposition. <laughs> that's, that's equally uh, important. Uh, anyway, um, on, uh, on the war issue, you should know that, uh, that Hungary has a very unique situation in this whole war because Ukraine is not a country far away. Ukraine is our neighbor. Second, we have um, minorities, ethnic minorities living in Ukraine, 200,000 something. Yes and they are part of the war. They are conscripted as soldiers to the Ukrainian army, so, and they die. So we lose lives daily, Hungarian lives as well. So therefore, uh, we consider this whole situation from a special angle. So we do not belong to the mainstream European approach. And um, my position was, uh, or the position of Hungary was uh, the very first uh, moment that uh, this war is the failure of dip diplomacy. It should have never happened, that war, outbreak. So uh, looking what's going on on the front line, for us it's obvious that the battlefield solution does not work. So whoever right and whoever not, you rightly describe the situation that Russia invaded Ukraine, but the question is not who invaded whom, the question is what will be the next morning. You know, the next morning, the fact is that more and more people will die and there is no chance to have a victory on neither side. So this is a war which just deprived many persons from lives without having results. But surely you, you can't, uh, we can all agree that the diplomacy before Ukraine was not successful, but there is a very big difference between the failure on that and the mere fact of invasion. And what intrigues me is you, as someone, you know, it was one of the great reasons you came into politics. You, you, you made a great deal about 19, I'm a 1956 fighter, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and fighting for freedom. You have a neighbor who was invaded by Russia, the very country, you know, you grew up with pictures of tanks going into Budapest. You know, why are you opposing no. the European aid? No, no, it's, it's emotionally. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's tragic. So, so we, all of our heart is with the Ukrainians. We understand how much they suffer, but I'm speaking here as a politician who should save lives. So the most important thing for the international political community is to save lives, especially when you are convinced, as I do, that there is no chance to win this war. So therefore, what we should do far more energy invest into to convince everybody that the only solution is ceasefire. And then after the ceasefire, peace talks should start. And then we could back to your point, yeah? To, do you, to but, the, you, but do you really think there is no chance of Ukraine winning? That's and my surely point. the main, surely the, they stand very little chance of winning without the aid which you are currently blocking. No, no, my, my, my position is that uh, looking at the reality, uh, looking at the figures, looking at the surroundings, looking at the fact that NATO is not ready to send troops, it's obvious that there is no victory for uh, Ukra poor Ukrainians on the battlefield. That's, that's my position. Uh, that was always my suggestion to everybody, that instead of uh, to manage to have a stronger involvement into the war, Escalation should be stopped, and we should argue in favor of peace 
and negotiation. It's you you don't, don't forget the fact. Russia is 140 million people, Ukraine is 30. It's interesting you say that, though, because my understanding is your foreign minister has not launched it under the reason that Ukraine cannot win, but that it's a kind of question to do with which, whether one of the banks is delineated yeah. as being a, um, a, yeah. the Ukrainians are treating them badly, which seems rather petty compared with this big issue. No, it's not. It's a question of principle. So the foreign minister was right. So if, as a country like Ukraine, would like to get your financial support, which is uh, inevitable for them. They can't put your companies on the blacklist. It's impossible to run at the same time. So if you need our money, please respect us and don't sanction our companies. That's so simple. We, you talked about NATO. Um, I was intrigued in terms of where you see. Imagine there is a ceasefire. Imagine there is the beginning of a peace with Russia. Um, you may have seen Henry Kissinger, someone who was previously rather skeptical about the idea of Ukraine as part of NATO, now thinks the idea of Ukraine as a buffer state, as something that sits in between the West and the East, has gone, and that therefore, as part of a peace settlement, Ukraine should come into NATO. Where do you stand on that? So that's uh, an interesting speculation. Um, it's good for intellectuals, by the way. <laughs> uh, but I'm a decision maker, so we should concentrate on as doer what should be done. And my point is that first we should have ceasefire. And then when we have the ceasefire, let's start about the new security architecture of the European continent. Um, my point is that the only peace talk and peace agreements could close this whole conflict if it is between Russia and the United States. So what is at the stake, of course, Ukraine is very important, but in longer term, strategically thinking, what is at the stake is the future security of Europe. And it's obvious that you, without the United States, there is no security architecture for Europe. And now the war cannot be stopped only if the Russians can make an agreement with the United States. As a European, I'm not happy with that anyway, but this is the only way out. One other thing on NATO, you also have objected to Sweden, or you you're seem to be least keen on Sweden becoming part of NATO. I know that you, you might well say that's members of the parliament, but you are, as we established, a very successful politician. Why, why, why object to Sweden coming into NATO? Because the political relation between Sweden and Hungary is awfully wrong, and we have to improve first. We would not like to import conflicts into NATO first. So first, manage the disagreements between the two countries, and then we are ready to support them. On, on the principal basis, we are in favor of that anyway. And we like the Swedish guy, but I mean the Swedish people, but the political relation between the countries is rather, rather nasty at this moment. Can we look at the European Union? Um, the EU is currently refusing or delaying handing over, I think it's $30 billion worth of grants and loans to Hungary. Um, you have protested about this. But I wonder, if you set a deadline for when the Europeans should give, should give you what you see as your money? I know, but we should understand the character of the, of the disagreement. Uh, it's not about the money. Okay. Money is important, but, you know, Europe is strong, Hungary is strong, so we can manage our economies uh, even without our own, uh, even, even on, based on our own resources. Um, but we have to understand that there are two basic strategical issues. We have disagreement with the mainstream of the European Union. The first is um, the, the discussion on de-risking or decoupling on one side and connectivity on the other side. And more and more European countries on the side of the de-risking or decoupling, and Hungary is strongly in favor of connection uh, and connectivity. The other strategical uh, difference is on war, because there is a war psyche in Europe. Uh, the, the mainstream and the majority think that they can win the war and there is a battlefield solution. Hungary disagree with that. So these are the main two strategical differences. And, and, the, and the whole involvement of financial issue uh, and financing questions, just the consequence of the two strategically different approaches. Do you, I, I, 
just struck me. Those are very big differences. You look back also at all your other difficulties with the European Union. Um, from somebody who comes from Britain, it does feel a bit like the run-up to Brexit, many of your heroes. Roger Scruton, we were talking about it earlier, your favorite teacher, backed Brexit. You feel like an inherent Brexiteer. No, no, why, no. Why, does, why does Hungary remain in the European Union, because, given your differences? No, no, it's very simple. The answer 85% of our export is going to European Union market. We are not as strong and powerful and mighty as the British are in terms of security and financial, so, you know, the, well, the perhaps situation Perhaps it's foolish, you know. <laughs> probably, but, 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 but now it's not a program anyway. You know, in the European Union, we have one, one basic difficulty, and this, this is the question of leadership. In the European Union, there is a very much intellectual approach to the question of leadership. And uh, they think that leadership means that we are led by institutions, and the job of the politicians to, to, to operate properly the institutions, which is a nice idea anyway, when everything is going well. But when there are difficulties, it does not work. Institutions are not helpful. We need leaders, human beings, who make decisions, take the responsibility, and so on and so on. So now we are living in difficult times, and European Union does not have that kind of leadership. But British leaders spent years complaining about the bureaucracy of Brussels, the blob, as some people called it. Surely you're in the same position as that. Yeah, the bubble is awful, yeah, in Brussels, in fact. So we have, it's the whole, the whole, um, uh, the whole life of, uh, of uh, European Union is over-bureaucratized and over-centralized, no question of that. You mentioned decoupling, and I've seen you've done a, a number of deals with China, and to, I'm going to try and generalize for the audience. You know, you have tried to take slightly the same attitude with China as you have done with Russia, that rather than being part of the Western side, you want to be one of the leaders of the rest. You want to be one of the people who is trying to link China and the West. No, no, is, that, is that a reasonable way to look at it? No, we don't have that ambition. The, the reason is that connectivity is a good thing. We have 10 million people. Uh, the export is 80, 85 percent of our GDP, so we are a very open country. And we need commercial and trade and political connections. So believe, we believe connectivity. So China is a huge opportunity. Why we should miss it? I suppose many people would argue because China could be the long-term opponent of the West. Or partner. Or partner. I, it's our that, decision. That, that may be very quickly, that may be an area on which you disagree with Donald Trump, for instance. Probably. Let's, let's wait him come back and discuss it. We'll come back to American politics at the end. Um, I, I, I wonder if the applause is for the idea of Donald Trump coming back or for the idea of him not coming back. Understandably. <laughs> um, uh, yesterday, to come to what you're doing here, you signed an energy deal with Qatar for the purchase of gas, and you said it's always better to stand on several legs than just one leg, which was presumably Hungary's, a reference to Hungary's reliance on Russia for gas. Um, can you give us any idea about what will come as part of that deal? How much gas you will know, you get from Qatar? The, the negotiations are still going on, first of all. Second, uh, Hungary is a landlocked country, which means that we cannot uh, we cannot neglect uh, the energy coming from Russia by pipelines. Uh, so half of the Hungarian uh, uh, needs uh, of energy are coming from Russia, long-term contracts, and the other half we have to find other partners. So we are looking for partners all around the world, and Qatar is a, is a potential partner for us. But you know, everybody's queuing at the door of the Qataris, so it's not easy to, to get there and to sign a deal, but uh, even if we are able to do so, uh, it could start not earlier in 2006, sorry, 26, uh, because till then the Qataris are uh, fully uh, occupied by. So we hope that we can cooperate. Qatar is a, is a country which we respect very much. Without them, Europe would have been in trouble last year. Uh, and we try to build up a more strategic cooperation with them, not just energy, but at the same time agriculture, IT, uh, uh, and basically uh, some security issues as well. Do you think you will get, um, there's talk in Budapest that some people think you will come to, you'll get the Qataris to help you buy back the airport in Budapest, which you have, you have been looking at? 
yeah, uh, Hungary, the main value of Hungary from, from your point of view probably is the geographical position because we are in the middle of Europe, in the middle of uh, Central Europe and all the roads are running through Hungary from north to south and east-west. Uh, airport has a strategic importance for us. Qatar is are in, uh, interested in. There is no decision yet. We are still negotiating. We would be happy to welcome them. They are still there in Hungary as investors. So you would, you would, like, to get, you would like to get Qatari money to help you buy back if you, as, as uh, an investor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, we are ready to be involved as well. So uh, strategical investments what we need in Budapest in the airport. It's not just to buy out, but to have a big uh, scheme to develop it as one of the competitive uh, airports uh, in the European market. Your critics would say that on getting rid of that tie with Russia to do with energy, you have been perhaps slower than others. You've done deals with Gazprom and things like this. Just as an example, you still have Russia's state nuclear company, Rosatom, building your nuclear power plant. Um, by any measure, it's not going particularly well, partly because of sanctions and so on and delays. Surely that is a place where you could just drop the Russian company and get a move on. Well, you know, um, so we, are, we, are, we are not as, uh, we are not in hurry in that respect. In Hungary, back to 60 years, we have a Russian technology-based uh, nuclear power station, which is functioning very well. And the Russians were always uh, reliable partners. And we would like to enlarge that nuclear power station. And to enlarge by a different, based on a different technology, it's very risky. So if we would like to enlarge on the same site, we have to use the Russian technology. So we continue to do so. And I hope it, we will be able to continue. You know, it's, it's a complicated process to build a nuclear power station. There are some delay, but I'm, I'm optimistic that we can uh, conclude it as it was planned. You may not agree with them, but can you at least understand why other European countries, when they, when they look at you and they see this slight, you're still hanging on to the Russians with your nuclear power plant, you still have the deals with Gazprom, you are still the person who, who is talking about Ukraine not winning and then just being a peace. You can, see, can you see why people think of you as being too much on the side yep, yep. of Vladimir Putin? For, for, obvious, for obvious reasons, but um, you know, now in Europe, if you stand on your national interest basis, you, are, you can be accused is, in, easily that you are in favor of, uh, of Russia. But, but the fact is that uh, my compass is always shows to the direction of the Hungarian national interest. I'm not, I'm not dealing with any other leader. I'm dealing with my own country. I stand for Hungary, you know? So whatever accusation I can get, or I will get, I will continue to have it. Um, and you are right that Hungary is a country which, which think that if you do something 10 times, like introducing uh, sanction packages, and it's failed, it's not reasonable to do it 11 times, you know? Do it again, hoping that the outcome will be different. This is against the common sense. So the sanction policy of European Union, in our understanding, simply does not work. But isn't that the whole point? When you talk about just being about national interest, isn't that the whole point of being part of a treaty alliance? The whole point of being something like the European Union is that, yes, you take into account your national interest, but in the end, you support your neighbors, you support the wider, bigger goal. In this one, ca one case, to push back Russia, in another case, to further the European Union. No, no, it's two separatable issues. First is, of course, we have to make uh, a, an agreement with the Russians about the future of European security. That's one thing. The other issue is, what is the future of European Union? And there are two schools in this respect in Brussels. First, it's a uh, United States of Europe, or as it is said by Brazilian language, ever closer union. Uh, we don't like it. We would not like to belong to an empire. We would like to maintain our national sovereignty. So the other concept is, that the second school is, to maintain the national sovereignty and imagine Europe as an alliance, a cooperation scheme of sovereign states. I belong, we belong to the second school. This is a big difference now and discussion inside the European Union. But, you know, the only way to go forward to discuss it. In terms of friends, you obviously have the Qataris here. 
um, in terms of the Arab world generally, in some ways, many people, you know, asking, some people are quite surprised you are here. You are someone who has taken, I'll be polite about it, a very robust attitude towards Muslims in Hungary. You have talked about Hungary being a Christian country. You don't want to have Islamic civilization invading Europe. So why are you here trying to get so, money from them? So, no, no, it's, it's not about money. What we are here is more political than economic anyway. Uh, but, um, but I think the main dilemma of the future is not whether it's Muslim or Christian. The main dilemma for the future, like migration, uh, gender propaganda, and the sovereignty of the state, you know, it's normality or, or abnormality, as we say. And Christians and Muslims can cooperate to defend and preserve traditional values. God, nation, family, this is the most important thing. It's not Christian or Muslim. So that's the reason why we can cooperate even on basis of principle with Muslim countries. Erdogan, who I'm very much uh, in favor of him, is a good friend of Hungary, good friend of, uh, of the Hungarian government. Even we have a very clear-cut Christian identity of our government. So the, the religion is not uh, a difficulty uh, in cooperation so your, between so these position, countries. Your and position is you, you, you are happy to meet Muslims here, you just don't want them coming to Hungary. No, no, that's about migration. So migration is a different issue. So the question is, who decide about who can enter into your country and who can stay there and you have to live with whom? Who is, who is the main authority to decide it? The national state or somebody else? And, and Hungary insists on that to make decision about who can come into our country and who we live with, it's our exclusive decision. It cannot be decision of Brussels or somebody else. So that's, that's the question of migration. It's, it's not a cultural issue, that's another dimension, which does not belong to Hungary because Hungary has a clear-cut, non-endangered um, uh, non, uh, uh, Christian identity. So we are strong enough in our identity. I wondered in terms of your, you, we talked earlier about um, Donald Trump's name came up. Uh, you've generally been more friendly with him, if I can put it that way, than other European leaders. Do, do, do you think that he will win the next election? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but DeSantis, who you were also somewhat close to, well, there seemed to be something of a, of a friendly relationship building. Yeah, yeah, he, he's, he's also a very good leader, but you know, I belong to the club of the veterans and the veterans support each other. You know. right. a, veteran who's, a veteran who's very much to the fore, certainly no one could describe um, uh, uh, Joe Biden as young. No, no. What is wrong with Joe Biden? No, no, it's not, it's, it's not my job to criticize the <laughs> head of the United States, you know, it's, it's not a good business idea anyway. Uh, so, <laughs> but you would rather, but you would certainly, but you would rather there was no, a no, different, no, no, you would rather there was a different leader I, of the no, United I States. Would, I, I would rather say that, uh, you know, the American Democrats are far more ideologically led than the Republicans. And the Democrats always like to convince you and sometimes force you how to live, you know? And I don't like it, you know? We have our own culture. The culture defines how we live. Don't interfere, please. Don't educate us. Don't say what is good, what is bad, what is liberal. You know, we don't like that. It's not your job. But it's not the job of the Americans and any other nation. It's the Hungarian job. That's, that's so simple. But there is Donald Trump understands it. That's important. But there is one big, very big difference is that Donald Trump sees issues like China, particularly, in very black and white terms. You know, he is the person who, who launched this not the first person, but he's the person who certainly accelerated America's decoupling from China. Yeah, yeah. It is hard to imagine him not pushing that further. Isn't that the main area where you, uh, you come into automatic conflict uh, with the people on the right who otherwise I, you support? I can't, call it, uh, I can't call it conflict, but we have to be very calmly state that the interest of United States and interest of European Union and the European countries in relation to China are definitely different. So this is the starting point. So to harmonize our policy or to cooperate on this subject requests negotiations between the United States and the European Union. And even if the President of the United States will and would be Trump, we have to negotiate on that seriously. It's a complicated, difficult subject. 
but I, th I think Europe sh should stand on its own interest in relation to China. And do you see any sign of a change in the European leadership towards people who would be more sympathetic to your point of view? There, at the moment, you are somewhat short of immediate allies in Europe, if I can put it that way, inside the European Union. Time can help. <laughs> what about in terms Not of so time? many now, but time can help. In terms, in terms of time, you, yourself, you have, you have served as your country's leader for a very long time. Do you have some internal date when you might move on? Uh, it will decide my wife. No, so it's uh, a <laughs> democratic vote. The democratic vote at home, you know, uh, uh, you know. That's the reason why basically we are here, you know, uh, uh, because I was first time elected as prime minister in, in, in 98. So I started to cooperate with the Qatari government anyway in 99, when the first time the Qatari foreign minister visited uh, Hungary. So our relation to Qatar, okay, economy is important. But it's not exclusively economic. Money is important, but investment is important. But our cooperation is more political than economic one. Going back, you know, personal relationship counts, personal loyalty counts, leadership relationship counts. So that's the reason why we have that kind of uh, privileged relationship between Qatar and Hungary back to 1990 when I met uh, the father Emir and that time foreign minister. The video I saw of you, you also talked about going to see Margaret Thatcher then, as going to see in those times. And I wonder, I just put it to you again, you know, the Viktor Orban who first arrived, merged, you know, for whom the Russians invading Hungary was a, was a changing point. Obviously, you know, you've only heard about it, but you stood up for all, you thought that Hungary had been betrayed by people during that? No, I was, I was the first leader in Central Europe who publicly requested the withdrawal of the Soviet troops from the Central European countries. It's true. But that Viktor Orban, you know, who emerged somebody who, who many people on the right, many people throughout Europe saw as a natural partner, somebody who could be part of that bigger, wider picture that you have gone in. The new Viktor Orban is a very different creature. No, no, but you are speaking of Ukrainian war again, yeah? Yes. Save Ukraine as much as we can. And the only good thing what we can do for the Ukrainian people to have ceasefire and peace and save lives. That's Viktor Orban's position. But has, but has your overall political philosophy changed? No, it's not about philosophy. It's about the war yes. and, and losing human lives daily. Stop it. Viktor Orban, thank you very, thank much, you very much for talking to us.